if you listen to Merrill Lynch or Smith Barney or Vanguard or Fidelity, they all have self-directed IRAs, but you can only self-direct in what they sell, which is stocks, bonds, and mutual funds primarily. Welcome to Target Market Insights, a podcast to help real estate investors navigate neighborhoods through the lens of local experts. Each week, we speak with local specialists to talk about their target market, useful tips, and the latest trends and developments. Location is the number one rule of real estate, and this show will help you identify best markets and sub-markets for your investing. This is Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman. Today, we're talking to Carl Fisher. Carl is a Cornell University graduate and third-generation real estate developer. He began his investing career back when he was employed as a rocket scientist at the Kennedy Space Center. But now he's one of the founders and principals of Kama Self-Directed IRA. Carl also has implemented plans and managed over $20 million in real estate transactions and has investments that include commercial, residential properties, from notes and mortgages as well. Let's welcome to the show, Carl Fisher. Hey, John. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here with you. Carl, very excited to talk to you today. We met briefly back in, what, uh, September, I think, at the J. Martin's uh, San Francisco Bay Summit. So it was good talking to you then. Realized we had uh, a couple things in common, but your your experience from a real estate standpoint is really impressive. And then obviously we want to talk to you today about the camera plan and self-direct IRAs. But for the people who aren't familiar with you, talk to us a little bit about how you got started in real estate investing. Well, I, you know, as you, as you mentioned, I'm a third generation real estate investor. My mom and dad were into it. Their mom and dads were into it. So I grew up around real estate investing. I thought it was just the way you did things. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it helped me understand why some people rent. So it was a little bit different perspective in that case. So even when I was in college, you know, going out and renting a renting a place to go skiing and things like that. I was one, one of the guys that did it for the whole group and figured that stuff out. So it was just second nature to me. My mom and dad uh, had their own apartments and would talk about it at dinner time. So you, you just kind of knew about it from growing up there. So you just got a chance to really soak it all in as a child, really, because this was really more your way of life than uh, something that you really had to learn about differently. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. So, and I know that you're a rocket scientist, which is fun. (laughs) How did you take this real estate investing piece and decide you want to be a rocket scientist? Well, I went to school at Cornell and and I got out of school and and they were just starting the shuttle program and launching rockets uh, sounded like a very fun job to me. I've always liked fireworks. I was grew up in Fort Lauderdale, so I was on my way back down from school. I stopped off at the Space Center, and they hired me. So I started working there. They were trying to get to you know a shuttle launch every two weeks, which would have been really fun. And I did that for about 18 years and did some uh, commercial launches and some military secret launches and a lot of shuttle launches and was in part of the R&D of that. But even then, I was buying real estate and and building things and and buying land just because it was, you know, second nature to me and it was a way to uh, make money and then also reduce the taxes because I ended up with depreciation on the property, you know, that I learned from my mom and dad. So that's an interesting thing. So as a rocket scientist, you are still investing passively in real estate through, was it apartments primarily or what kind of investment uh, vehicles? Well, it started off being land and then uh, single family homes. I didn't go into the apartments until uh, later on. So it was just, you know, little things that I could just do when I was uh, still working as a rocket scientist. You know, I got married, started having kids and started buying a couple pieces of property as, as time permitted. Bought one, built a house on it and lived in it as well. So it just was kind of a progression going out. Got it. Were you managing these yourself? I was. Okay. You know, I, you know, I just started off to it, you know, after I built up some more, I built a management company, which I still own today. But obviously after 2008, nine, it started to uh, downsize it. And, you know, I'm, I'm a buy and hold guy. And 
at this point, I'm getting up there in age, so I'm trying to offload the stuff that makes sense and probably just keep keep my properties in uh, Pennsylvania and Florida because that's where I spend most of my time. And I want to get most of my properties into my IRAs and 401ks and not have too much of it outside of there. I want to simplify my tax bill uh, going forward. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you talked about getting those properties that you do want to keep into your IRAs and simplifying your tax bill. What, give us a little bit more. Why exactly? What is the benefit of putting that in your IRA as opposed to having it separate? Well, I'll tell you a little story how I got started in this was my dad, like I said, was in real estate and he died land rich, cash poor in 1993. And I went down to help my mom settle the estate. And I have 11 brothers and sisters, so she was spending more time, uh, you know, I still had some younger brothers and sisters at, at home, and she was spending more time on family issues than on the business, so I went down and helped her out. And one of the things that I found out is that when my dad died uh, short, shortly thereafter, one of the notes I didn't know about went into default, and it had a default rate at 28%. It was, you know, commercial property. I had an interest rate of 28%. So to stop the bleeding, I went into the newspaper and I found a guy that would lend money, talked to him, and a week later, I had a uh, loan on the property. I signed signed for it at the closing and I noticed that it was in an IRA, which kind of interested me, but I didn't have time to address it at that point in time. So 10 months down the road, I got the estate pretty much in order, was able to refinance the property and pay him back. So I asked the guy, I said, you know, would you lower your interest rate from 12%, right? I got it down from 28 to 12. And now I told him, if you give it to me at 7%, I would allow you to hold the note and we can make it 10 or 15 or 20 years, whatever you want. And he goes, no, thank you. Refinance me and get me out. My investors pay me 12 to 18 percent, and I'll never go lower than 12. You got 12 because you had a good piece of property and a low loan to value. And I said, Well, it's going to take you time to get the money out on the street, and, and you might get somebody you have to foreclose on. He says, I'll have the money out on the street in less than a week, and I was hoping to foreclose on you. And I said, You you know, which struck me by surprise. I said, why? He says, well, look how much money I would have made if you foreclose, you know, if I could foreclose on you. So the fact that you're paying me back, I made 12%, which is all right, but that wasn't, you know, why I wanted to do that. So just those words made me start to think about, well, foreclosure isn't that bad of a thing. You know, some people look forward to it. So I changed my perspective a little bit. I paid them back. I went down to the closing. I called up the bank, uh, you know, a week later and said, hey, I want one of those IRAs that Rodriguez had. And the woman said, how'd you get this number? And I told her my name and said, I've been dealing with you for, you know, the last 11 months. I was just at the closing. She says, you don't have enough money and please don't call back here again. So I said, well, this must be a special club. And then I started looking online for, or not online, but you know, I called Cornell, tried to get into their library and find information out about it. I called the IRS 800 number, talked to a couple people there. One of them said, you can't do it. Another one said, yeah, you can do it, but I don't know where it is in the publications. But then the internet came out and I just kept researching it because I knew it could be done. And I fa finally found out how to, how to get it done. And of course, nobody knew about it then. It was only a tool for the wealthy to use, you know, the Mitt Romneys and the Trumps probably knew, knew about it, but the common man de definitely didn't know about it. Cornell's library had no literature on it. But once you got into the internet and about two years later, I figured out how to do it. So I put a trial transaction together and did it and it worked out and showed it to my accountant, attorney and banker. And they said, okay, if you do it like that, it seems like everything's okay. So after that, I just started helping other people do it because I thought it was great and they thought it was great. If you can have tax-free income for your life with a Roth IRA and you can invest in real estate that you can have some control over, it just made good sense. So I felt like I had helped the family out. They had taught me real estate and the benefits of real estate. I just added 
this next tool onto it, which just makes it even better uh, for future generations. So I started teaching my brothers and sisters, and my sister said, hey, I really like this. Why don't we start our own business? And the people we were helping said, why don't you start your own business? So that's how I started Camaplan with my sister who had a background in the finance and technology and, and IT world. Awesome. That's an, an amazing story. So let's, let's back up a little bit for people who don't really know much about self-directed IRAs, right? You talked about settling your father's estate. And as you went through that process, you found someone to loan you money, realized that that money was actually in an IRA. And then kind of once you had the chance to dig deeper into it, that's when you started to discover more about what the self-direct IRA is. How would you describe a self-direct IRA for someone who's never even heard that term before? I'll give you two things. One is I take the McDonald's, you get to supersize your order. When you do self-direction, you get to supersize your IRA because now you have a multitude of things to invest in. Just exponentially increases the amount of things that you can invest in. If you listen to Merrill Lynch or Smith Barney or Vanguard or Fidelity, they all have self-directed IRAs, but you can only self-direct in what they sell, which is stocks, bonds, and mutual funds primarily. With us, you can buy real estate, you can buy you know, commercial, residential, industrial uh, real estate, you can buy them in any one of the states that are out there. You can buy notes, you can lend money, you can buy discounted notes from the bank, you can have first or seconds amortizing or interest only notes, you can buy into private placements, and you can buy actual precious metals, gold, silver, and platinum and palladium. And then we have some outliers like tickets, automobiles, llamas, things like that. But that's <laughs> llamas. Yeah. That's a small percentage of what our, our clients Wait, you have clients that, that use their self direct IRAs to buy llamas? Absolutely. And then the llamas, you wow. know, they, they shear the llamas and then that, that the I don't I guess it's it's I don't know if it's fur, but whatever you call it, they go out and make sweaters and rugs from. So they sell that and that all goes into the uh IRA. Wow. I mean think about that. So you're you're basically saying from llamas to real estate to gold to notes. You can use a self-direct IRA to invest in all of these different things, which I wouldn't have even looked at llamas as an investment vehicle, but you're telling me it is. That's that's really amazing when you think about the diversity. And I love the point you started with when you talked about now self-direct IRAs are available by a lot of different institutions, but most of them will direct you into the product that they offer, which is stocks and bonds and mutual funds versus going with a company like yourselves. And I know that there are other companies that offer similar type of services where you can truly invest in a multitude of different investments. So you said llamas counts and they're included. What kind of things are not included when it comes to self-direct IRAs? Well, it's pretty simple. Life insurance and collectibles are noted in the IRS publications as prohibited transactions or disqualified investments. And what's a collectible? You said collectibles. Right? Collectible, you know, like a coin collection, antique cars, rugs, jewelry, those types of things. And they're, they're pretty much lined out. The IRS doesn't tell you what you can invest in. And if somebody does say that to you, they're lying because they never tell you what you can invest in. They only tell you what you can't invest in. And it's a very small list. Got it. So a self-directed IRA, like I said, supersizes your the different investments that you can have. And basically, I say you can invest in anything except for life insurance and collectibles. Okay. Makes sense. And then I know there's some limitations as well when it comes to personal property. Can you explain a little bit on the personal property side? Um, I, yeah, I think you're alluding to the fact that you cannot sell property to yourself or to your IRA. If you own property, you can't sell it to your IRA. If your IRA owns it, you can't live in it or use it. Uh, it has to be strictly for investment purposes. Not only are you not are you prohibited from doing that, your mother and father, your grandmother and grandfather, your kids and grandkids are disqualified from selling or borrowing or using your any assets that your IRA has. So there are disqualified people out there that you're not allowed to do business with. A lot of investors want to do their own rehab. 
as an example, if your IRA buys a property and you like to go in and swing the hammer and paint the walls, that's not allowed with a uh, IRA owned property or your IRA owned property. Now you can hire people and, and have them paid from the IRA to do the painting and the hammer swinging and the plumbing, et cetera. But the sweat equity that some investors like to put in is disallowed in that because it's, you know, it's like considered a contribution to your IRA. Mm. So the, you said the people who are the, the things that are disqualified are in things that you personally own or get some direct benefit from. So like a personal house. And then you also mentioned that essentially the direct lineage, right? So your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, they are disqualified, but a brother or sister, an uncle, a cousin, they are qualified, correct? They, right. They are not disqualified people. You can do business with those. Okay. Makes sense. And then from a rehab standpoint or managing a property that you own within your IRA, you personally cannot do the rehab work. What about like property, like managing the property, screening tenants, placing tenants? Can you do that or do you need to outsource that to a third party property management company? No, that's always a point of contention and people say that. The main thing you have to do is not not touch the money coming in from the rent. Have the money go directly to your IRA or to a property manager. Can you pick a plumber? Can you pick a, a an electrician to work on your property? Yes. And have your IRA sign a contract if necessary with them? Yes. If you want to do a review of the tenant before you let them in there of the paperwork or their credit report, et cetera, or their application, yes, you're allowed to do that. But as far as taking the money and going in and fixing any repairs or anything like that with the tenant, you want to have somebody else do that. Awesome. So who should consider a self-direct IRA? People that want to have control of their investments, people that understand what they're investing in, because one of the criticisms of self-direction is that it's risky to do self-directing. And I'll tell you right now that any money that comes to us before it's invested is put in an FDIC insured account. I don't think you can get any place uh, any more safe than that. But when you go and buy something, whether it's a stock or a bond or, or llamas or a house or a or a car, or an apartment building, or condo, there's risk associated with all of those. The question is, how do you view that risk? Like, I grew up around real estate, and I'll tell you straight out, I'm biased towards it. I've seen it. I know the risks associated with it, and I'll put my money in real estate over stocks and bonds all day long. I've tried the stocks and bonds. I've got the software. I don't think I'm stupid, but I mean, I'd rather play blackjack in Atlantic City than put my stuff in stocks and bonds just because I'm I'm that inept at it. But I have a cousin that does really good in stocks and bonds, and I would say he should stay in that because I think he's got less risk in stocks and bonds than he does in real estate. Mm. I think that's a great point. Right? We, I think everyone's always looking to diversify because they feel diversification brings more security but, at this, but to your point, that knowledge base and what you're comfortable with and what you have a deeper knowledge on is probably going to make you in a better position than just taking a little bit of money and spreading out to every single kind of asset class. Yeah, I don't think you want to do that. And I mean, Warren Buffett was, you know, quoted as saying, you know, it's great to diversify, but don't diversify into things you don't know. And, you know, he never got into any of the real dot com stuff. Right. He says, I don't understand it. You know, he likes the brick and mortar and he invests in things he knows and understands. And I think that no matter whether it's with an IRA or without an IRA, if you're going to invest, that's the way to do it. And invest in yourself and your time to learn those things. So how much time have you spent investing your time and energy into learning llamas? Llamas? Well, I didn't invest in any llamas. <laughs> Some of my clients did, but... I just can't get over the llamas thing, man. Yeah. I can't get over investing yeah. in llamas. Well, I went out to the farm and looked at it and, and researched it. There's a llama it. farm? There is. Yes, there is. It's over in New Jersey and, and they sell it. And, you know, and then I looked at the products that they make when they uh, do the shearing of them. It's quite fascinating. I don't know that I'm good at it, but uh, I did buy some some llama 
sweaters and gave them out at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. So let's go back to uh, what we were just talking about when it comes to people who want to take control of their investments and investing in a self-direct IRA. So I know a lot of people, you know, aren't as familiar with self-direct IRAs, but maybe work for an employer and had a 401k that rolled over. So either it's still with that former employer or they're looking to roll it over now. Or like for me, I had a rollover IRA, which I just rolled into a regular account. But how would you, what's the first step you would take for someone who has an account that qualifies to be rolled over into a self-direct IRA? What's the first uh, thing or first piece of advice you would give someone there? Well, I would say, you know, pick custodian that you like and that has a good reputation. And I think our company was built by investors for investors. So we set up the pricing and the situations for investors. And that's kind of how we did it. So the first thing I'd say is look at that. I think there are some good companies out there. I think Bigger Pockets talks about them. I'm not saying that we're the best, but I do believe we are. One of the things I want people to do before they invest is to do their due diligence. So one of our things is not to charge anybody uh, anything but their $50 fee. So we don't have an a annual fee until somebody invests because we want them to do their due diligence. So the first step I would say is pick your custodian, open up your account and get some money into it because once you do that, you'll start looking and opportunities will show up and you want to be set to uh, capitalize on those opportunities. And it's and what's the process with the custodian, right? So you've, you've got this custodian, but as the person who, again, if, it's, if this were, let's say, Vanguard, you know, with Vanguard, you know, they, they, they have some options. I select the options and they go buy those stocks or mutual funds. With this, because I am doing more of the direction, but there's a custodian, how exactly does that relationship work? All right. Well, let's, let's just go through it. So you open up your account. You have an IRA at Fidelity or old 401k. If it's an IRA, you'll fill out a transfer form. You'll send it to us and we'll go to Fidelity or Vanguard and get the money. We'll notify you when we send the letter out to them. You can call them and try to get them to hurry up because being your account, they'll hurry up more than, a, than when we tell them to hurry up. Then, of course, they'll send the money. The money will come to you. We'll notify you that the money's in your account. And, it, you know, while this is all going on, obviously, you should be out looking for an investment. Once you find that investment, let's say you want to lend somebody a rehab, money for a rehab on a house they're rehabbing, or you want to buy a house. Once you do that, you will fill out the uh, paperwork, be it the note and mortgage, or be a sale contract. Once that sale contract is filled out, you'll sign it as read and approved, send it to us to sign for your IRA, we'll sign it, and you'll negotiate the pricing, et cetera, going on. Once everything is done, we'll make the final signing on that. We'll send the down money that, that goes there. The inspection and appraisal will get done. It'll go to closing. You'll review all the HUD paperwork, the appraisal, and everything that's associated with that. And then once you're you're done with that, you'll tell us, here's the documents. I've signed them. Please sign them for the IRA. And we will uh, sign for the IRA. We'll send the money. The deed will get recorded in the name of the IRA, CAMA plan for the benefit of John's IRA. And then the rents will start coming in and you'll be able to look at that online. Awesome. Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a great tool and a great step. And it's something I think not just uh, real estate investors, but really any investor should at least know that it's an option as we all are planning for our long term future and retirement and understanding what options are available to us. You know, for those people who do want to take more of a control position of the investments they make, this is a great platform. And I think that whether you do want to invest in real estate, which is something that, you know, certainly I do and I know other people do as well, or you just want to buy into gold or llamas or whatever else, it's a great tool that allows you to do that. Again, they, it's very similar to, you know, again, a 401k or a regular IRA where you can't touch the money until, you know, you're what, 59 and a half. Is that correct? Yeah, but there's rules around that. If somebody, you know, we have people that retire at 40, 45, and there's called a 72T distribution. I don't want to get too technical, but substantially equal periodic payments. There's ways to get the money out. 
before you're 55 and a half. There's some other strategies out there where you can give your mother a Roth IRA or your grandmother, and then that money can start coming out early too, you know, and some people will do deals for them and their, you know, in real estate. So, you know, we can make that a another podcast uh, down the road on different strategies on how to get money out before you're 59 and a half. That's awesome. That sounds like a, a great strategy and definitely a topic we'd love to broach, you know, understanding like, how do you take advantage of, again, the tax code? It's it's uh, very interesting. I was talking to a group of investors last week, and part of what I explained to them in simple terms is that the tax code was written for investors and business owners, and that there are a lot of loopholes and a lot of opportunities to take advantage if you are in one of these categories, but understand that you have to be in one of these two categories if you want to take advantage of it. So it's a great, great listening to talk about the 72T distribution and some of the other avenues that you can leverage if you start running into situations where you want to tap some of the some of that money a little bit sooner yep and i mean ultimately you pay a 10 percent penalty for taking it out early that's that's the worst that's going to happen you know and that's not a killer but you know right and if you really need it you're probably not going to have to pay much tax on it anyway right right good points all right so let's switch switch gears a little bit i want to get into some of our bullseye round questions the first one here, I want to understand from you, what's one thing that our listeners can do to help win their market? And in this case, let's talk about, again, know you have a lot of experience from an investing standpoint in real estate. What tips would you give, one tip for our listeners to help win their market? To win their market, I would say, you know, so many people are investing outside of where they live. And I would tell them to go there rent a place and stay for, you know, at least a couple of months, get to know the area and get to know the people. And my sec, my second one is there's all these new apps and social media marketing and sales and things that are uh, just, you know, fantastic out there. As an example, I foreclosed on a place in Texas, like July 20th, and I sold it by August 11th. And I used, uh, uh, or I had a friend of mine put the property on Facebook uh, in the Houston area. And I, you know, that was all done within three weeks of getting the property and then then reselling it. Mm, That's very quick turn on that. Yeah, I mean, it's way better than when I started out, you know, with newspaper ads and things like that. That's a great point. I mean, Facebook, I, I think naturally people went to like a Craigslist or, or an outlet like that to, to try to sell properties. But understanding that Facebook has actually become a major player where you can sell properties on Facebook as well is definitely something our listeners should keep in mind. Yeah, and I think there's always new new things that are that are coming out. Yep, absolutely. What's the best business or real estate book you've read in the last year? The one book I really like is called Keep It by Joe Luby. And the reason I really like that is it saved me tens of thousands of dollars in taxes, you know, back in like 2010 or 11. And it's talking about converting from traditional to Roth IRAs. Keep it by Joe Luby, L-U-B-Y. And then an old classic I like is Think and Grow Rich. Use your mind because that's uh, one of the best assets that you have. Hmm. And one of the tips you took away from the Keep It book was really about Roth IRAs versus traditional IRAs. Right. And how to convert them and how to save the money. Excellent. That's great tips. Give us a, a mobile or a digital resource you use for Camo Plan in particular. For Camo Plan in particular, well, for my real estate investing, I'll, I use, you know, the Realtors, Trulia, Zillow's just to get me in the ballpark and to come up with fair market values for real estate that's owned in the IRAs. I tell you a new one, and I don't know if you met him or not, John, uh, Dave Lecco, do you know him? I don't. He has a new app called The Deal Machine, and I had a interview with him just yesterday on that and you go up you go around and you drive around into any area and you take a picture of the house and you upload it provides the owner's name address and email if you need it just from a from a picture and it will uh, send a postcard to them as well with a picture of their house on the Ah. front of it it's called the deal machine and and you know he might be a great guy for you to uh, interview at one point in time 
young kid, you know, electrical engineer that's pretty smart with the technology. I feel like I'm falling behind. You know, I can't I can't keep up with these young whip, whippersnappers. <laughs> you know, I'm by no means uh, great on that, but I but it does keep me young to see all the cool things that are going on. Well, that sounds amazing, right? And I have heard of the deal machine once I heard you describe it. And I do think that to your point, technology is always changing and shifting. So there's always going to be something new and ways to do the same thing, but just do it in a way that's maybe a little bit more efficient. And I think something like the deal machine is great because the same thing that you would have to, you know, create a list and write it down, or you find a property that you think is a great prospect, but you've got to go write it down, get home, you know, back in the, back in the day when you didn't have a cell phone, you got to actually, you know, call or look up the information and do all this stuff. And now if you can pretty much drive around, see something, put it in the phone and have the postcard on its way. I mean, that is, I mean, that saves you a ton of money, a ton of energy and makes you extremely efficient. So, I mean, ways to leverage technology in your business is always something that's going to help you grow. Absolutely. Yep. Give us one thing you do daily that helps you stay focused on your goals. I make a list uh, every morning and then I go over the list that I had the day before and see what was done, what was completed and what hasn't been done. And I've done that for a long time. And I just think that's what helps helps me stay focused. Daily lists. All right. And you're based in Pennsylvania right now. I know you go back and forth between Pennsylvania and Florida. Give me the best place to grab a bite in PA. The best place to grab a bite in PA. I like the Philly cheesesteaks in downtown at uh, Geno's in downtown Philadelphia. They have a couple of great prime rib places there as well. But I'll have to say Geno's and the cheesesteaks. There we go. Love that. And then I know we didn't get super deep into Camel Plan. For those listeners who have more questions or want to learn more about self-direct IRAs, what's the best or what, what's the best place for them to get in contact with you? If they go to our website, capital C A M A P L A N dot com, Camaplan dot com, they can schedule an appointment or a call. They can schedule a uh, to come into the office if they want, or they can just peruse the website. We've got webinars on there. We've got classes coming up on there. So I would say go to the website and set up an appointment or call us at 215-283-2868, 215-283-2868, or shoot us an email at info at camaplan.com, C-A-M-A-P-L-A-N.com. Excellent. And give me a project that you're working on right now. What's, what are you excited about? I'm excited about in, improving our company infrastructure with new technologies that are coming down the line as far as customer protection against hacking and also customer ease, because that's always one that's that's we've been we've been fighting with. How much how many passwords do you need? How many credentials do you need to get into a system? And then how much, uh, you know, if you give too many, nobody remembers them. If you give too few, everybody can get in. So we're looking at different ways to make it easy for our clients as well as protecting them to the highest degree. Awesome. Well, Carl, this has been extremely informational and definitely a great time talking to you. I am about to run out and transition all of my self-direct IRA to purchasing llamas immediately. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll keep doing the investments we're doing in real estate. But no, this is great. I had no idea that you can invest in some of the different things. I, I knew you could invest in a broad spectrum, but not all of the different things. Hey, one last question. You know, one of the big things that's coming up now, and uh, I heard questions about this over the Thanksgiving table, but cryptocurrency. I know that that's not currently backed by gold and there's some regulation concerns or challenges. Is that something that currently qualifies for self-direct IRAs or do you know kind of where we stand there? Funny you should mention that. We actually have a, uh, at the Pyramid Club in downtown Philadelphia on January 23rd of 2018, we're going to have a meeting talking about Bitcoin. But yes, there are people that are, are putting it into their IRAs. They have to kind of do it. There's a couple ways to do it. We're trying to find out better ways of doing it. But there's rules and regulations that go along with the cryptocurrencies in the crypto uh, currency world. And they sometimes bounce up against the IRS rules 
as to who holds the cryptocurrency because you personally can't hold your IRA assets. It's against the it's against the rules. That's why we're in business. And the cryptocurrencies, you know, will only allow you to have one account with them, some of them with especially Bitcoin. So we're working with the different providers of this and we're uh, actually working with Dan Hunt and Jay Ligaber who are pretty heavy into the Bitcoin and, and very familiar with the other world cryptocurrencies. And I think they're picking up and, and when I see you're going to be able to use cryptocurrencies to pay on Amazon, then I think they will be here and they'll probably be here to to stay. But I don't know what the feds and the governments around the world are going to do with those. I don't know that there's any currencies backed by gold anymore out there. So cryptocurrencies might be the future because look at all the wiring and electronic money that gets moved around daily through the Federal Reserve System. It's just astonishing. You know, banks, banks don't hold very much money anymore at all. No, great points. It's something definitely to watch. And I read recently that there was someone who bought an apartment building using cryptocurrency not that long ago. So it was like the first transaction where someone accepted Bitcoin as the, uh, you know, the, the purchase. So it's very interesting to kind of monitor and see the role that that plays and how it shifts specifically for um, IRAs and, and, you know, maybe more of the traditional investment tools, but also the way it impacts real estate. Yeah, it's definitely had a great run. The Bitcoin has, you know, since it since it started there, and if you know, if if one Bitcoin owner doesn't mind taking Bitcoin for an apartment building, I think that's great. I think even five or six years ago, Donald Trump said, you know, don't give me dollars, give me gold for one of his places in New York. You know, so yeah, the currencies are are going to be in an up uproar here for the next couple of years. I think. I just am worried a little bit about the laws that they're going to put around it because I don't know how the government's going to track the cryptocurrencies and how they're going to tax it and everything else. So if they get too big, you know the feds are going to take it over. Yep. Yeah. Good things to watch out for. So anyone who's interested in cryptocurrencies, just kind of keep those things in mind. We definitely have to keep an eye on the tax man and what may be coming there. Carl, this was great talking to you. Thanks again for spending some time with us today. And I hope you have a great day. I do. Thank you, John. I really appreciate you taking the time and look forward to setting up another one, maybe with the uh, ways to get the Roth money out early. Absolutely. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for listening to this episode of Target Market Insights. Now, I know I got some great value out of today's guest, and I hope you did too. And if you did, I need you to do me one big favor. Drop me a quick line and let us know, right? So you can shoot me an email. You can shoot me a text. You can you know, tweet me. You can hit me on IG in the comments. You can slide it to the DMs, whatever. Um, <laughs> but if you go ahead and do that, you know, my information is there at Jay Kasman for Instagram, for Twitter. And then you can also reach out to her, my email, john at kasmancapital.com. So with that said, I need you to do the same thing for our guests. So our guests are dropping some great gems, some great knowledge. I need you to reach out and let them know that you appreciate the information that they're giving. So their information is always in our show notes. You can check them out there. One last thing, if there are guests that you would love for us to have on the show and talk to, let us know. Or if there are markets that you want us to talk about, send us a note. I mean, there are definitely some markets that we haven't hit yet. So we want to make sure we get some guests to provide some information and some knowledge on those markets soon. But by all means, if there's, there are markets or there's something that you guys want to hear about, let us know. It, it kind of helps us make the show even better. If you have not yet, please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And make sure you don't miss an episode. So with that said, thank you again for listening. And we look forward to bringing you more great target market insights. Take care.